You know, in the world we live in, it's constantly changing. And what people consider important changes, changes year by year and day by day. Do you know that 50 or 60 years ago, people put a lot more emphasis in being respectable and being respected in the community. People wanted to be respected by their friends and neighbors. Now it seems nobody cares, or at least that seems to be a good Im impression that I get sometimes. And in those days, to live a respectable life meant living a life that was above reproach, morally. Morally above reproach. It meant living in accordance with accepted standards of correctness and decency. Now today, those standards have changed drastically for the world we live in. But they've not changed for God-fearing Christians. For Christians who respect God and His words, our standards are the same as they were 2,000 years ago when Jesus taught them. The same. Christians understand the true value of being respectable and being respected. And they understand the real value of respecting other people. Respecting others. Now we mention this because you're graduating today. You are. And we congratulate you for that. And whether or not you're graduating here today from high school or college or junior college or junior high school or grade school or trade school or whatever school that it may be, you face a world with completely different standards than your grandparents faced. Completely different standards. You really do. When I was a young man living in Norfolk, Virginia, men and women who were caught cheating on their spouses were arrested, put in jail, tried, and had a permanent criminal record. Whew. Tell me about it. Teenagers who were caught engaging in sexual activities were sent to reform schools and they had a record even though it was only a teenage record, which would be wiped off when they were a little older, or at least ignored. And girls who became pregnant out of wedlock with, were social outcasts. And the baby was usually taken away from the mother. And anyone caught engaging in homosexual activities or soliciting such activities was arrested and if found guilty, had a police record, and they went to jail. The point is, that the world used to despise these things and what it used to despise it now holds not only as acceptable but even as honorable and respectable. That's the world. The world's views have changed. But un understand this. Those are just about though the same worldviews that Jesus lived in in that world, in that pagan society of that time, everything was about the same. It was about the same. Young people, you'll see much more changes by the time your grandparents, I'll guarantee you. But always remember, always remember to distinguish between the world's standards and God's standards. They're different. They're completely different. And although we live in this world, if you're a Christian, you're citizens of God's kingdom, and you live by God's standards. Now Paul had great concern for young people and what they valued and how they lived, as is illustrated by his words to a young preacher living in a very pagan world 2,000 years ago. By the way, all of these changes and everything else, and we have to understand this. Never ever think that because the world changes its values that God has. 
God hasn't. And God still holds up that standard. But also understand this, that God is still the God who forgives. God forgives. And we have to remember that. He forgives us. He forgives us. So we don't want to lose sight of that. But the thing is, we also don't want to real, lose sight of the fact that God does have some standards and He wants us to live by them. And He encourages us to live by them. The problem is, is that we get caught up in the world. In the world and its standards. And so, preachers of all people, of all times and things, constantly want to remind their people that, hey, there's a higher standard to which you're called. Graduates, live by the higher standards. Don't live by the low standards. Don't live by the standards of the world. Live by God's standards. Live so that you can feel, that you can respect yourself for the rest of your life. That you won't have something that's going to be lurking in the back of your mind that you wished you'd never done. Just don't do it. And you'll never have to live with it the rest of your life. And never have to be embarrassed about it when somebody even mentions it. Let's look at our verse today. We want to look at God's standards. The ones we want to live by. Let's look at one little verse in the first letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers. Read that one again too. But set an example for the believers. It doesn't say set an example for the little kids. It says set an example for those old folks. Can you imagine that? Isn't that, isn't that contrary to what we usually think and, 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 and talk about all the time? It's usually the old folks we say, hey, y'all need to be examples for the kids, you know. No, it says, hey, you young folks, you need to be examples to these old folks. Show them how God really wants it to be done. Live that kind of respectable life. Show them that it can be done. Because it can. It can. It really can. Listen, this applies to all Christians. Let me read the rest of the verse first. It says, But be an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. And again, it applies to all Christians, but it applies to you graduates. It applies to you. It applies to all you young folks. Listen. We understand this. That you don't want to try to be respectable in the world's eyes. You want to live respectable in God's sight. Now, some people just see this as orders, kind of like given from an old general to a young officer, one of his young officers, or instructions given to a young upcoming preacher by an old apostle, a war horse of the faith. But perhaps because of my own point of view, I kind of like to think of this as a grandfather pleading with his grandchildren perhaps even begging them to be careful how you live. Please, be careful how you live. That's what it's about. Be careful how you live. What the old grandfather wants is for his grandchildren above all else to live for God. Now what Paul is saying is 
this. Live respectably. Don't let anyone look down on you just because you are too young to know the difference between what is right and wrong in the Lord's sight. Don't let anyone look down on you because you act childish. <clears throat> because you have it in you. You really do. You have it in you to live a life that is worthy of respect and honor, even in the sight of God. Now Paul, he isn't trying to get Timothy to start building a fantastic portfolio or resume of himself. That's not the kind of respectability that God wants from his children. That kind of respectability is for another venue. What God wants from his children is to have character. Character that displays the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The kind of respectability that Paul wanted to see in Timothy. The kind of respectability that God wants to see in us. And it comes from what? From making wise decisions that are right and good in the sight of the Lord. That's what it's really about. And you begin by doing that when you're young. When you're young, listen, it's not a game. It's not a competition. Although everybody makes everything a competition. Listen, graduates, God is simply calling you to do what's right. That's what he's doing. Do what's right. That's all. I remember seeing young men and young women, especially the children of some teachers in school. These kids, they join clubs, but they make sure they join the right clubs. And they make sure they take the right classes. And they get involved in volunteer work, in the right volunteer work. And they get involved in working for fundraisers, the right fundraisers. And they get involved with working with nonprofit organizations, volunteering, the right volunteer organizations. And they run for class offices. And they work hard to get A's. And getting involved in, they want to get involved in anything that might impress someone else. And make everyone else look and say, aren't you great? Aren't you just like your mama or daddy? They did those things for one of two reasons. Either to look important for themselves or to appease their parents. In the end, it is just a competitive game. And some of those parent teachers have read the riot act to other teachers because their child didn't make an A on a test. And if you've been around the high schools, you know. You know. It's a sad thing. I've also known people who, who chose which church that they would go to based on the contacts that they would meet there. Listen, it's not about making a name for yourself in this world. It's not about that. It's not about making a reputation for yourself. No, it's, it's not about that. All of that kind of activity is nothing but hypocrisy. Respectability is it's not just a thin outer shell that we coat ourselves with. Respectability runs deep and it goes all the way down to the very core of your being. Paul was saying, being young is not an excuse for childishness. Being young is not an excuse for sin. Notice, notice again what Paul says. He says, while you are young, 
set an example. Set an example. Set an example. Notice this means, this seems to be backwards like we said a minute ago. We usually do what we do the opposite. Everyone else wants to be a, 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 an example for the, for the young folks coming up. But young folks, you have an opportunity. You can stand out as a Christian. You can stand out for Christ Jesus. But you can't do it if you want to be first. You only do it if you let Jesus be first. You only do it if he's first. Listen, Paul places the responsibility of being an example on this young man. And the implication is that this responsibility is on all youthful Christians. Paul clearly says, be an example for the believers. For those that are in Christ. It doesn't say be an example for the world because the world doesn't care. It doesn't. Paul says, be an example for the old folks. And I guess that Clarice is in that category now because she just had another birthday. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. I'll never live it down. But, uh, but the thing is, be an example. Be an example. How? Well, first he gives down to some specific areas. First example he says is, hey, it's in your speech. In your speech. Listen, Scripture says that every word we speak is important. Of course, when you listen to the way that some people thoroughly waste words by babbling on and on and on without really ever saying anything, you might not think words have any significance at all, but they do. Words are very important. Everything about speaking is important, even to the fact of using correct grammar, although most people won't think so. And refraining, refrain, I'll get that word out in a minute, refraining from using filthy garbage language is important for all Christians, but especially for young Christians, if they're going to be good examples. The words some people put in their mouths would clog up a toilet. Now these are only a small part of using words that set an example for others. Today, being polite and respectful in our language sometimes seems to be a little bit of a lost art. But it's still appreciated. You know, when I was a boy, even the adults said, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And I'll tell you what. I dared not address anyone without saying Mr. or Mrs. before their last name, and that was no joke. My daddy never thought it was a joke. I remember one time a fellow was over at the house, and he was in the service, and my dad was, and he said, oh, don't call me Mr. Sylvester, just call me Al. I said, no, I says, hey. I said, it might be all right for you, but if my daddy heard me, I, I wouldn't want to be there. And that was the truth. Now, a lot of that's simply about a matter of culture. And in that culture, they taught respect and insisted on it. And Scripture also says a lot about culture, but it says a lot about what we speak. Scripture condemns slander, words from your mouth. It tells us not to say anything mean to anyone about anything. And it also warns us about gossip. And any other words that would hurt somebody. And scripture says that instead of malicious words from our mouths, our mouths should be filled with words of praise and encouragement and thanksgiving. Graduates, young people, and everyone else, set an example in your speech. And second, set an example in your life. And when he's talking about life, it's talking about everything you do in your life. Everything you do in your life. That's what Paul is referring to. The places where we go, the things that we do, what we do affects other people contrary to what people will try to tell you. 
Everything you do affects somebody else. It really does. Paul is not concerned about us not concerning, uh, not sinning. As much as he was concerned that we not act in ways that offend people. The sin was bad. Yeah. But don't be an offender. Don't offend people. Don't live that way. And it was so, Paul was so, so concerned about that, he even talked about eating in the church and orderly worship and meat sacrifice to idols. And he said, listen, just live a life that brings honor to God. And it doesn't, it doesn't demean anyone else. And Paul says, set an example in the way you live and also in the way you love. Now people can't, can't help but see the love that God has and the love that Christians have for each other. You can't help but see it. They can't help but see how you love them. They can't help but see that. Listen now, this is not emotional romantic love. It's not love of convenience. This is a love of choice and commitment. This is the kind of love that the wedding vows actually speak about. Is where it says, in sickness and in health, for richer, for poor, and forever? This is the kind of love described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and 6. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. This kind of love cannot be imitated or mass-produced. You can't just paint a thin coat on and think that it's going to cover up all your wickedness. This kind of love goes all the way down to the depths of your heart and mind and soul. Set an example in your love. That's what Jesus says. And fourthly, set an example in your faith. Now that doesn't mean running around spouting the word faith at every opportunity. Like some people seem to do. They run around and say, just keep the faith, just keep the faith, just keep... Empty words. It's not about that. And it doesn't mean saying, well, hey, I've got faith in Jesus I know that Jesus can do the impossible. We're going to take out a million dollar loan so that we can build a brand new facility. And I've got faith that Jesus is going to make sure that we pay that loan off. Have you seen bankrupt churches? They're there. They're there. Now, faith is what Abraham had. It's trust in God. It's trust in God in the good times and it's trust in God in the bad times. It's trusting in God when you make the right decisions and it's trusting in God when you blow it and you've made the wrong decisions and you can trust Him because you know that He's going to forgive you. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter about all these other things. God loves you. God forgives you. If you just want Him to forgive you, He does. Faith is about trusting God and to recognize that God is there when you flunk. When you flunk. When you don't make the A. Twice, Abraham lied about his wife being his sister because he was afraid. And twice, God rescued him. Abraham had faith in God and believed that God would have a great host of descendants coming out of Abraham, despite the fact that he hadn't had any kids yet, and despite the fact that he let Sarah convince him that God needed a little help. 
So he had Ishmael through Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. Hagar. Faith. Listen, it's got to be something that's at work in you and it's growing in your trust of God grows a little bit each day. Look at Abraham's life. God's faith, his faith in God was growing and growing and growing. And isn't that the way that you want your faith to be? And I hope so. Young folks, look. Start building that faith and let it grow. Let it grow. Let it grow. Set an example in faith and set an example in purity. And purity means keeping yourself from being contaminated by the evil in this fallen world. It has to do with recognizing the difference between the things of God and the things of the world. Scripture clearly, clearly defines the difference for us if we look for it. Of course, most of us don't want to look for it, do we? No, we're never going to be perfect in this world and we should never expect to be. But we can see the difference and we can see, pursue the godly way and not the worldly way. Jesus told us to take the narrow way that leads to life and not the wide way that leads to destruction. Graduates, young people, Scripture calls you. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example to believers. Set an example for the believers in your speech and in your life and in love and in faith and in purity. Listen, the choice is yours. Will you live for Jesus? Will you be an example for believers? Will you do that? That's what Jesus is calling you to do. Every one of you young folks. And old grandfathers are begging you. Please. Please. It'll spare you an awful lot of grief. Please. We're going to have an invitation hymn today. Perhaps someone needs to name Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life and be washed away, uh, have their sins washed away in baptism. Perhaps you need to do that. Perhaps maybe you want to be a member of this congregation. We're going to have that invitation now. Jimmy, if you'll come and lead us. And uh, if you have a decision to make, please come forward. Jimmy. Shall we stand? Number 404. <clears throat>